operator. Are you getting Mr. and Mrs. Ed Sullivan on the phone? Thank you. Just say it's Hi Gardner Call. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Marilyn. I'm Ty Gardner's secretary. And we're going from the office of the Syndicator Herald Tribune Channel here in New York. Tonight, we'll be speaking on film with one of the most successful showmen and MCs in show business and television history, Mr. Ed Sullivan, together with his lovely wife, Sylvia. The first Hello. Hello, Mr. Ed Sullivan. Hello. One moment, please. Hi, Dr. Collins. Hello. Hello, hi. Hello, Eddie. This is uh, Novelty Night. Two Broadway columnists who speak to each other. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. Is Sylvia with you tonight? Yeah, she's here looking very lovely and feeling very nervous. Oh, that's impossible. We'll, 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 uh, uh, I'd like to chat with her after a little while. Eddie, uh, I understand that, that uh, this is uh, the first time in 11 years that, that you faced the Zoom on camera the last time was when you and uh, Milton Berle were, were launching the Cardiac Fund Drive 11 years ago at the Wanamaker Studio of Zoom on. That is right. Well, now, uh, actually, you, you've got an anniversary coming up in, in June, 10 years on the Sullivan Show. Is that right? Well, originally it was close to the town, and then they, they called it, named it after me. So that was the, uh, I guess that was the acid test time. Ten years, that seems... Really ten years and just a couple of months now. You know, uh, if somebody were to say quickly how long is it, I'd say maybe five or six years. Well, I'd, I'd say the same thing, because actually it doesn't seem like Any idea of how many different accidents you put on in ten years? Well, we were figuring up the other day for a, a story that uh, CBS was putting out. Perhaps I shouldn't mention the other network. Why not? Uh, 52 shows a year, 10 years, 520 shows and averaging out about eight performers. So it's around 4,000 performers, and taking out perhaps 500 for repeats, it'd be about 3,500 separate performers. You know, I didn't realize there were that many performers uh, around doing TV. Uh, but somebody, uh, I think it was Newsweek at one time, uh, ran an item saying that Rocky Marciano received $1,500 just to take uh, a bow from the, from the audience. Uh, that is right. It is right? Mm hmm Put them out in the audience. I thought it'd be a little, uh, you know, a little novelty to have them out in the audience rather than on stage because, you know, when you present somebody on stage, they always expect them to break into a song and dance. So that, on that particular night, I remember it very vividly because Rocky was out in the audience. And curiously enough, although he comes from up around, you know, the Boston area, he never met Ted Williams. And the minute Ted Williams finished on stage, he did his on the stint. Ted, is there anything you'd like to do particularly nice? I'd like to go out there and shake hands with Rocky Marciano. It's been always my idea to be a champion. So it's quite a thrilling moment. Well, that's very interesting to get the $1,500 for a handshake. Well, I'm willing to settle for it myself any time. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, uh, is it, did you find that when you started, or even now, that, that other newspapers are reluctant to publicize you personally because uh, you were a rival newspaper man? I don't think so. I, it might have been, a, you know, a very few individual cases, but uh, not so. I, I saw some of the kinescopes of our early shows, and if I'd been reviewing the kinescopes that I saw, I certainly would have uh, beat off on myself. Too. Well, don't forget that at that time, uh, you, were, you were running against other shows, which uh, uh, I think you were, you were so head and heels above that, that uh, it's all a matter of time, too. You were uh, playing around with an infant. It was scary in those days because they always told you to work into the camera, you know, they said to work to the camera with the red light on it. And not being a performer, the thing just petrified me. I looked at that iron on screen, if I had any, you know, blood that hadn't coagulated before then, just looking into that particular camera. Now, I'd no notice tonight we had Charles Boyer on it. Boyer in the rehearsal said, Eddie said, now, he said, I'll give you the exact position I'll work. He said, I'll work to the left of the camera. He said, you can set your lights there. And I noticed the same thing with Charles Law. But Fred Astaire and all of them, none, none of them ever worked directly with the camera because they say it does have a chilling effect. Is that, uh, was that one of the reasons you looked uh, so <laughs> grim all the time? The Great Stone Face in 1948, and I've been defending my championship successfully ever since. Who gave you the name Stone Face? Uh, Merrill Panett, over in Philadelphia. And it, it really sucked, huh? Uh-huh. 
Uh, Ed, how did you ever get that uh, uh, phrase? I mean, uh, even coming uh, from the part of the country that you do, the word uh, show is never pronounced shoe. Where did you get the big know. shoe from? I really don't know. They used to kill me when I went to you know, school in Portchester. It was always with minutes the way I talked. It, it, I, I seem to triple words together. You know, I say, no, we can do shoe. Did you talk that way at that time, too? Uh, I think so, because they always kid me. Well, Lisa, that proves again that you're a completely natural. Yes, I always, I, I always was, because I knew it was hopeless to attempt, you know, to become a, a, a polished performer or take uh, diction lessons or have my teeth kept or anything. <laughs> you know, I got a, I, I got a, a, a kick, believe it or not, aside from our long-time friendship, I got a, a tremendous kick out of uh, seeing you hit it in TV. Because, uh, if you remember, back in the days of low state, I, uh, happened to be one of the people, I think I was on the Eagle at the time, who made the comment that I think you do a tremendous MC job because you sell the act and not yourself. And I thought that uh, it, was a, it was a great departure from the usual MC who comes out and does a testimonial dinner to himself every time he introduces anybody. Do well, you think if, you're that not that a, if you're not a performer, the, the instinct would be to go out there and just introduce your act and uh, get out of their way. And the fact that I always picked my own acts and selected my own talent, I was always rooting for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be difficult for a performer to, to take, you know, as uh, uh, a viewpoint as objective, I think. Well, some of them uh, try it here and there, and I think, for instance, one, I think Jack Benny. I think Jack can do almost anything. Well, he's just an uh, A couple of years ago, on the same subject, uh, Harriet Van Horn described your success as follows, and I'm quoting her now. She said, he uh, got where he is not by having a personality, but by having no personality. He's the commonest common denominator. Now, how did that hit you at the time and now? Well, it's that whole gag of the nightclub just takes him to no one. See, I don't like Harriet Van Horn. I think she's a singularly inept critic. She thinks I'm a singularly inept performer. We're dead even. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the, of the comments that uh, Mr. Uh, Steve Allen had to make about uh, another critic, the critic on the journal, uh, about uh, a month ago? Well, I admired his courage. I admire his courage, while well, I think it's a strictly private fight going on there. Uh, I, I, I did think, but Steve, I, I didn't think he had that much uh, moxie. <laughs> Have you ever kept the file of, of uh, some of the nasty personal comments or the belittling remarks or just plain ornery reviews uh, through the last 10 years? You don't actually have to keep a file of them. I always remember them word for word, comma for comma. <laughs> you mean you even, uh, you even, uh, or a quick study with punctuation and that sort of thing? Oh, yes. If you remember, if you've never had a photostatic memory, you remember when they're rapping. And I always used to laugh when I was out on the coast in 1937 to 39. And you'd interview a man like Adolf Mind, you or Spencer Tracy or any one of them. Uh, and you'd say, did anybody ever rap you? And they'd, they'd either have the clipping with them or they could recite it. Uh, you know, word by word. And I thought at that time it was an application, but I understand. It's sort of, they really burn quite deeply. Isn't that funny? Uh, mm -hmm. I have found that to be true, but I don't carry them around with me. I, I, I can't carry that much weight. Remember Gene Tunney, when I was writing sports, Gene Tunney told me once, he said, of course, <coughs> we've been having an argument about something. Not a fist argument, you understand, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know Gene you're still said, here. He said, you know, he said, I relax because, he said, my handlers and my business people, you never manage, you never permit me to read anything in favor of it. But there was a fellow out in Cleveland once, and he decided what he said, and there was a fellow down in Dallas. He never read them, but he knew them all by heart. And I can, I can understand it and sympathize with it. I have uh, asked Presley that question one time, and then you, whether he read any of the uh, nasty reviews, and he said, uh, no, uh, he doesn't uh, know whether they have any because uh, they just don't show him that type of thing. You know, you, you and Steve Allen have something in, in common, too. Whenever anybody prints anything that, that you think is unfair or inaccurate, both of you immediately sit right down to write a letter uh, giving you a version of the facts. Now, about what percentage, uh, Ed, of such inaccuracies uh, are usually correct? Well, the, uh, I, I don't write those letters anymore. I found it was a one-way street. But early in TV, I used to sit down and write these impassioned letters, and Sylvia would say to me, now, don't you mail it. You read that tomorrow morning. I'd say it's going off right now, and I go off, and I get my brains beaten out of the consequence of that later. But, but uh, Sylvia was right. Yeah, she was right, and yet... Nervous, but right. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, in, in mailing them, uh, uh, Ed, I think that you've got something off your chest, and uh, uh, I think that the publicity, uh, pro and con, also helped that rating, you know? Well, in those <coughs> early days, it seemed to me, uh, 
uh, from my experience, the limited experience I had in show business, in the early days of TV, I was very reluctant uh, to have advertising agencies, you know, did not know a great deal about the show business as TV was projecting it, say, well, the New York Times doesn't like our show, and the Herald Tribune doesn't like our show, and the Journal American doesn't like our show. I, I was afraid it would influence them, so I figured if I'd write these letters, that I would stop this barrage. But it just, it, it just worked the other way. Uh, Ed, uh, why do you think a, a Broadway or a movie critic is content to praise or damn a show once, and then go on to other things, and uh, yet the average TV critic seems to make a serial out of uh, a show or a personality that he doesn't like personally? Well, I think it's unfair, but uh, human nature being what it is, and uh, managing editors, you know, being as lenient as they are with writers, I suppose I could tell you a bit in my column, too about things that steam me up. You keep returning to it, and returning to it, you know, you're uh, worrying a bone in your teeth. Uh, I, I don't think it'll ever be corrected uh, by it. It's human nature. You haven't, you haven't done that uh, in, in recent years, have you? Well, I never did as a matter of fact. I don't recall uh, anybody. Because I always remember getting a wonderful lesson in it from Captain Patterson, who knew he was the greatest publisher since the days he goes up to Pulitzer. I've been working at the uh, at the news for a year, and I've never heard from Mr. Patterson, Captain Patterson, after the engagement. Then one day, Sam Goldman came to town with a picture in which he said that he was going to establish a new star on the stand. I saw the picture, reviewed it, said that uh, I thought he was a pretty bad actress. And it was the first time I heard from Captain Patterson, he sent me a memo. He said, I don't necessarily agree with you or disagree with your opinion, because I feel very hurt that any writer working for me jeopardize a uh, girl's job. It was uh, a very forceful lesson and a very strange piece that you should practice. I think that you ought to uh, take that uh, little incident and run up an anecdote again. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed, if you were running a newspaper and hiring a TV critic, exactly uh, what would you look for? Well, I think what I'd do, Hi, actually, is uh, I think it'd be a wonderful thing for the TV critics. Uh, as well as for the performers, if they had, if they had varied the coverage. I think that any one person, say, covering television for 10 years, can, must become uh, rather bored with it. And uh, things that once seemed bright and shining in their eyes could be uh, after 10 years, or five years, or three years of continuous viewing of television shows could look uh, pretty tarnished and dull. I think if they had rotate people, if they take them off the city desk and let them on the show, if they take them out of the sports department and let them on the show, I think in that way you would keep, uh, maintain a spontaneity. It's awfully difficult to uh, uh, continue if, 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 if day after day and hour after hour you're watching TV. That, that, that's my answer to you. I think it's a good idea. That's been, uh, some, some papers uh, thought of uh, trying to do that. General reluctance on the part of most writers to move into another department. When you move into sports, you've had experience in that. But if you move into it, you find by the time you get used to it again, you're shifted back to your own spot. Yeah, well, I think it would uh, provide a fresh people. I may be completely wrong on that. No, I think I think I think it's a very good idea. Uh, uh, Ed Jim Jim Bishop and his uh, uh, series uh, about you said that with all the money coming in, you remain comparatively poor. And then you blame this on the fact that you like to shoot craps. So? Uh, yeah. Well, I shoot crap craps once a year. Uh, we passed through Las Vegas for perhaps two days in a year. At that time, I bet, and I suppose my maximum bet would be $50. Uh, I blame myself for being poor. It's not partly all my fault. It's my partner, Uncle Sam. He keeps me poor. Yeah, you I, I've never of much of a gambler, high. I, I, uh, I didn't think so, and I, I was wondering about that item. There were a number of those that I, that I wanted to check with you. Uh, I, what I was trying well, sometimes, to you know, they, they, they interview somebody, and he seems so normal that they put in little embroideries to, you know, to make it look like a glamorous character. Yeah, but, but the craps thing, I thought was a uh, uh, new angle. Well, you've known me for a long time, you know, that I never went to the racetrack. Ed, uh, how come you're going to uh, spend uh, a month this summer by actually... Uh, doing two shows a night at the Desert Inn in, in Las Vegas. I know it's uh, they've got a golf course in the backyard, but uh, do you think this will give you enough for relaxation? Well, we'll have a wonderful time out there because we'd be on the coast anyway, spending our vacation. I, I like, actually, you know, with Waterville out, I used to play quite a lot of water. 
And uh, the old, when we played Baltimore, there were five shows a day. It just seems to me that I'll get a kick out of meeting people face to face, and that's the tourist season out there. Mm -hmm. and working directly to an audience rather than, you know, the, the, the lenses or the interruption you know, provided by three cameras on stage. I think I'll get a right, great kick out of it. It reminds me of the old days of those State and Roxy. I, I read in the... In there's a very good golf course there, too, you know. Oh, it's a beaut as far as I'm concerned, yeah. because you get into one of those little wagons, and you step on the pedal, and you don't have to even walk. I'm going to get in a little wagon right across the Rocky Mountains to Los Angeles. That's, that should be a very nice trip. Ed, uh, I read in the Variety that, that you were planning an all-Canadian show one, one Sunday. What's yeah, we're hoping a little workout. In fact, we had just surveys to make it find out how much the additional cost would be. We're out to about $17,000 extra cost now. Mm -hmm. If the Eastman Kodak group in Canada want to put up that additional money for their, their whole the convention, we'll go up because we can spare it out of our Ed, I wonder if you just, uh, uh, pardon me for a minute, don't hang up. I'd like to talk to you and something about uh, 60 seconds. Right? I won't go away. I Hello, Ed. Yes, hi. You still there? Good. I'm here waiting. Uh, Ed, I'd, I'd like to, to uh, talk to Sylvia in, in, in a minute. May I, uh, let's put her on now. I'd like to get a few angles on the fellow by Well, well you know her for a long time, hi, so I don't have to accomplish any introduction on the phone. All right, well. Sylvia, don't be nervous. Right. <laughs> Sylvia, Hello? what do you mean, don't be nervous? Are you nervous? I certainly am. I have butterflies. But why are you nervous? Well, I don't know. I've never done this before, with the exception of person to person, and that was several years ago. Well, uh, the, the difference, of course, is we don't even bother using cameras. Well, that does make it easier. You I'm see? beginning to feel more at ease. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how is the battery in the utility? Perfectly wonderful. Good. Uh, I was just looking through a, a story of, uh, that she wrote in Family Circle some time ago, and I think it's one of the best uh, stories that any uh, girl ever wrote about her daddy. And one of the things she mentioned is that uh, Ed uh, was always in the habit of writing uh, uh, lovely little letters. Does he still... Uh, uh, he well, not so much now, because after all, that was when she was growing up. And uh, the last letter we wrote to her, really, was the uh, day she was married. We, uh, presented her a book with a book that we called Windmills or Draw. We loved it. Mm -hmm. And it was limited edition with love unlimited. That's right. And we put all the letters that Ed had written to Betty in this book and uh, then wound it up with her uh, bridal picture. And the amazing part about it was that we, Ed and I both got such a kick out of doing it. And yet, when Betty received the book, she was quite upset because it was the end of an era for her. And she said, you know, she said, in a year or two, I'll love the book. She said, but right now, she said, I just feel strange about it because it was the end of her childhood. Uh, I remember one, one series of columns that Ed did. I followed it for years, and I thought it was one of the best ones that he was using, and that was called Listen, Kid. Now, was that inspired by your Betty at all? I don't think so, not really. Uh, it had a, you know, it had such a, a wonderful warmth, and it was completely moments, but I think the time has come for Ed to uh, start doing that over again once in a while to get the chance to. Yes, I think it would be a very good idea for Kitchen to be a new day. Sylvia, how long do you put a now? It'll be 28 years, the 28th of April. 28 years? Yes. Isn't it fantastic? Well, how, uh, uh, how do you, how do you feel the, the, the white, the Broadway columnist that you can, uh, enjoy your private life. Everywhere you go, everywhere you move, you're constantly recognized and bothered. Does that bother you? 
pie. I've loved every minute of it. You have, huh? I really have. Well, do you look upon Ed now more as a, as a TV star than as a, uh, uh, as a Broadway film? Well, I think so. Uh, I know that he's always, will be a columnist and he'll always be a writer because that's his first love. But somehow the television seems to have overshadowed, uh, you know, his writing a column for the time being anyway. But well, actually, I think his television show is a, is a column with you. Yes, that's I mean, true. He, I think that what he's done, I think he's transplanted the very format to the screen so successfully. Yes. Uh, Steve Allen's wife, Jane, tells me that she never goes to watch her husband do his TV show live, that, that she enjoys watching it at home on her TV set. In the meantime, she watches uh, your husband's show on a second set that puts the sound off. Now, what are your Sunday night at 8 viewing habits? Well, I never go to the TV or to the show either, but I just watch Ed's show because I don't think that I could be honest in my judgment. Uh, I don't think you can look at someone uh, when your heart is involved that you can look at another show and uh, judge it objectively. So I just watch that show. Uh, honey, according to Jim Bishop, I talked to Ed about him before. Uh, he said that, that uh, uh, Ed Sullivan, around 1929 and 1930, had so many arguments with Sylvia that the two of you used to stand around staging farewell dinners to each other. Was this serious or was it strictly a standing gig or wasn't it true at all? Well, no, I think it was true. I mean, we were always having farewell. And it was a lot of fun, I. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were always, uh, we couldn't quite decide whether we wanted to get married or not. And so we would say, well, next Monday night we will have a farewell dinner. And then we would reconcile and we would keep having them. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, this was before you were married then? Yes, that was before. We were married I in 30. See. Yeah, well, you said around 29, and you said yes. married 28 years, so mathematically, I think of that. Yes, that's right. Pretty good at the time, right? <laughs> Yes, very uh, good. Incidentally, uh, uh, Jim also opened one chapter by saying the Sullivans are by choice, somewhat aloof and lonely. Now, I have known you for many <laughs> hundreds of years, and I never thought that. <laughs> no, I did neither until I read it in his, in his story. Uh, I think uh, the reason for that was that I had said that uh, we don't uh, have many social appointments because Ed, having, as you well know, living by a deadline all his, all his days, felt that for the evening he wanted to be completely free. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he was never keen on too many prearranged dates because he might decide at uh, 7 o'clock that he wanted to go to a movie picture or he might decide he wanted to take a nap and go out to dinner at midnight. I know, yes. And uh, it's his only way of relaxing, because as you know, you know how heavy it is around the house. Mm -hmm. Ed does work at home. Uh, Sylvia, I think that before Eddie gets to a long way, and I am in the future thing to leave, may I just uh, talk to you for a little bit too? Indeed. And if you think that you were nervous, let me tell you something. That, that if you're not nervous, I don't think I would have had either an opportunity to say hello. <laughs> I think I think it was wonderful to have you on, and it was a delight. Buddy. Well, hi, you know, I've enjoyed it. Thank well, you. Well, let me come back. Yeah. Well done there, girl. You, you said something yeah. about that girl being nervous. That she girl, was. That? She was very, very was nervous. Was she really? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You can't tell by, by uh, watching a monitor over here or listening to it. Reminds me, you know, some, one night Oscar Hammerstein was on the stage and I was asking Oscar how he had to encourage After seven years of success and eleven years of success at Davis, continuing to well, he's done very much in love with her. A very lovely girl is very much in love with me. I was so struck by it because he was so much in the Well, I think that's an excellent thing. Well, I think that it's a wonderful thing. Well, I'm going to look at both of you and know that what you just said is completely true. Ed, i got a few more things here, and I think we've got about two or three minutes that we can talk to you about. Fine. Hiram? One one thing that John Crosby wrote in his column, I think it was last year, he said, and I'm quoting him now, uh, I noticed that most entertainers consider Sullivan fundamentally a newspaper man, but while most newspaper men consider him fundamentally in show business. Now, how do you consider yourself? Well, I'd say that fundamentally I am a newspaper man. And I've uh, ever, ever started to get off the water block before I think that I'm over in the record of the Greek story. I think a lot of up there, and, and the first time I came to work in the American email back in the time of the water block of the palace. And I do feel shy that I... I had a great sympathy and a great understanding of the performers, whether they were in sport or in the stage. 
So I, I think the development of the whole thing, from my own experience, is that I, I did learn a lot about show business. You know, the things that audiences seem to like, and, you know, the kind of show has to be. I'd say that fundamentally, and I am, after all, we will be interested. Ed, uh, I think this is going to be a, 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 I said originally when we started, but it's a very novel interview, two uh, panelists talking to each other. But I think it's going to be novel uh, in another respect. I'm not going to discuss ratings with you at all. That's well, I the last word. I wish you would, because you know, the one thing that people don't quite understand ever is that the, the primary rating and the ultimate rating is your sale of your subconscious product. Uh, remember when Desi and Lucille were at the very peak, they still are, but mm -hmm. the early times when they were at their peak. Their sponsor dropped them because they couldn't sell their product, and they moved to another sponsor, and that product they did sell. So the, the, the big rating always is sale of, uh, sale of product, and uh, the other ratings can be a guidepost. Neil Sink again with the warning to show going down the hill, or going uphill. Uh, in the final payoff, now on our show, we, you know, the sponsors pay $11 million per year for 52 shows. But, you know, as businessmen, as a big corporation, they don't spend unless they're getting revenue back out of it. It's as simple as that. Uh, you, you, uh, you now have off-name sponsors, right? Hmm? You, you have off-name sponsors now? Yeah, Mercury has it one week and then he's going to go after me. Yeah, that gives me a chance for letting me uh, say right? that. Uh, well, the reason I say that is that in addition to kind of show you that an awful lot of the agents say, too, that you're one of the best salesmen they've ever had, uh, even away from the show. So I think that's uh, something that something never shows up in the rating. Yeah, you know? that's, that's so. Uh, Ed, uh, there was, a, there was a, a question here that I wanted to get into, but I think I'll have to do that off the phone after the show, because, after the show, pardon me, uh, because we want to get about uh, 10 or 15 seconds to go. Uh, I'd just like to, to uh, mention this, that uh, you're going to be in, in, uh, at the Desert Inn in Las Vegas, in uh, July, right? Yeah, we open up there in July section. So what uh, what I'm going to try to do is to get out there. I'd love to catch your your first show there because I think I put the first show in New York, and this is sort of the cycle. Well, I'd really enjoy it, I, because you've always been a thoroughly nice guy, and I'm just uh, of course, Sylvia and I have always reveled in your success. Well, that's very sweet. It's a pleasure talking to both of you, and uh, see you soon. Thank you, I. Good night now. Good night. Well, I guess, uh, Marilyn, uh, that's that for tonight, hmm? I hope that you folks enjoyed meeting Sylvia and Ed Sullivan. And next week at the same time, join us again when we'll be splitting screens with another happily married TV family, Steve Allen and his wife, Jane Meadow. Meantime, good night now.